There we are. So the session's now being recorded. I'm going to hand over to Lynn in a moment, but just bear in mind that we're going to pause throughout the taster session. Every few slides will be pausing for questions and for your input. So please do think about what you'd like to ask, any comments or queries you'd like to add. Um, and I'm going to introduce Lynn Cade now, the Programme Manager for PHE. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, just wanted to check that everybody can hear me. Can I have some little smiley faces or some little hands up or just something? Yes, everybody can hear me. And we've got somebody new who's just joined us. We've got Frank and Barnaby, so hello. So as Olivia said, my name's Lynn Cade and I'm the programme leader for the preparation for higher education course here at the Lifelong Learning Centre. Today's session, I would normally, uh, in times not quite like the times I'm having at the moment, be running this session face to face with you in a room with the sun shining on us. I'm hoping you're all in a room with the sun shining on you. Um, and I will be doing a little dance now and going around the tables and introducing myself. So you're going to have to imagine me dancing. So think of Granny Does Saturday Night Fever and you've probably got it right. That's me. And hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. So let me begin. The session today is intended to introduce you to a little bit of what we do on the PHE course. I'm hoping to give you uh, an introduction to the style of teaching and learning we use on the course, uh, but also some of the content. And one of the things that we do do on PHE is talk to students and support students to develop not only academic skills and personal skills, but also skills that they might find useful in terms of their everyday living and studying. And so one of those skills that I think is extremely important today in contemporary times is media literacy skills. So that's what we're going to do today. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Please raise your hand or put some any messages that you want to send to me into the chat bar because I have got the chat bar open and I can see them. Hi, Barnaby. And Joe's laughing, which is wonderful. That's what I want you all to do is laugh. Uh, so let's see if we can get to the next slide. OK, so one of the things I'm going to do today as part of introducing you to what media literacy is, is to look at the role of media in society. So I've now got a diagram for you to look at. So let me talk you through it. We all live in a society. Within that society, we live in our own communities. We learn about our society, the communities that we inhabit, and indeed about ourselves and the world around us through the knowledge, the messages, and the images that we see through the media. Now, there are lots and lots of media forms. There are newspapers, television, film, um, things like Instagram, online presence, uh, Twitter, social media. As the title suggests, these are all forms of media. What we've got under the box that says society of degree of structural stability varies. And what we mean by that is society is a moving, living entity. Sometimes it's extremely stable and at other times it's not. And I think at the moment we're probably in a time that we can say is a little bit unstable as we go through the changes that are being uh, thrust upon us by the COVID-19. So the media responding to that, probably more so, and focusing on that, and are more present in our lives than they might be in times that are not COVID-19. Now, the audience for media, we've got under their degree of dependency on media information varies. What, that, what we mean by that is media audiences are varied, and um, some people spend a lot of time using media, media some less so but the information that we see through the media is different for each individual and what i'm hoping to do in this session is introduce you to some strategies where you might use the media in a more active way than before so what you have is passive media consumers 
which suggests that people view media or listen to media or read media in quite a passive way of consuming it. So they think about it on certain levels, but maybe not on deeper, meaningful levels. I think what we've got at the moment is a situation where we need to be more active in the way that we consume media. I'm going to go down to the box at the bottom that says effects, cognitive affective behaviour. The media do indeed affect the way we think, feel and behave about our lives, about the world around us, about our societies and communities and about current events. So the media does inform us and that information will get us thinking about things, feeling about things and in a way we will then respond by the way we behave. So let's go on to the next slide, shall we? Is everybody OK? If you're not OK, just raise your hand if you want me to clarify anything at this point. Just giving you a minute to do that. And I'm getting some little thumbs up. Thank you ever so much, Joe. So the next thing I want to move on to is so it's all right talking about the media and the influence it has and the role it plays within society. But there's always been, particularly in academic circles, the question about does the media actually influence our ideas and opinions? So going back to the slide previously, does it actually have any effect on the way we think, feel and behave? This is a huge academic area and there are lots of theories for example media effects theory that have looked at this and research being conducted that suggests that yes the media does influence our ideas and opinions in particular which then can influence the way they feel about others around us but also how we behave towards each other so what i'm going to do now is give you an example of uh, one of the first pieces of knowledge that was used to suggest and to provide evidence that yes the media does influence us so i'm now going to click on a link and i'm hoping that you therefore see a video that's coming up on youtube now what this short video does is introduces to or um gives us a little glimpse of a broadcast that went out on the radio in 1938, a broadcast that was designed and presented by Orson Welles. So let's just have a quick look at that. Lynn, shall I, I will share the video to the main screen, if that's okay. That's perfect, thank yeah. you. And the link, so we're gonna share it in the main screen, um, so you can follow it on there. Sometimes the quality isn't that, with videos so my colleague Olivia has also posted the link into the chat so you could also just click on the link but I will share it now one second there we go We now return, return you to you Carl Phillips, Phillips at Grover's, Grover's Mill. Mill. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, may I? Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back to Stonewall and joined Mr. Wilma's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. More state police will arrive and drawing up the cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to. Keep their distance. The captain's conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Ah, oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they parted, and the professor moves around one side, studying the object, while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. But there's something happening. A shape is rising out of the pit. And make out a small beam of light against the mirror. What's that? She had the flame springing from the mirror and a big spot of the infected men. It strikes them head on. Lord, to turn you to flame. Ah! 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 Ah!
Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there is some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Endelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We continue now with our piano interlude. The lit mobile just sent me this solar wireless. Sorry, I'm just bringing the slides back up now. Hi. I'm just doing a little bit of typing here while I'm I'm talking to you. So keep a, keep your eyes on the chat bar as well. So in 1938, when this radio broadcast was broadcast by Orson Wells, listeners to the radio were very susceptible to the messages coming through their radios because obviously they, had, they didn't have TVs as such. Uh, in fact, I can't remember the year TV was invented, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but indeed, people having listened to this radio broadcast were reported to be running out into the streets, scaring, scarily running around, picking up the belongings, thinking there was indeed an alien invasion. So if you do that, I'm going to bring Google the notion because obviously this taster is about becoming a Google goggle boxer. So now I'm just going to bring Google in. So if you wanted to follow up what you've just heard on that recording through YouTube, if you put into a Google search, uh, Orson Welles, War of the Worlds 1938, you'll get quite a few pieces of information and short clips, including ones where Orson Welles at the time following the broadcast has been interviewed by journalists asking him did he expect the reaction of his audience to be as it was which were that people were genuinely fearful of their lives they genuinely believed aliens were invading um, and they were running around panicking so do do sort of follow this up but this was one of the first examples that has been used that has been used to demonstrate that the media do indeed influence our ideas, our opinions, our behaviours and our feelings. So we're going to take from that that the media does influence us. Particularly if you look at the way that COVID-19 and the issues around the NHS have been covered recently, uh, not only on radio, but on our television screens. We've had daily broadcasts from um, Parliament. We've also had um, programs around COVID-19, but we are being continually bombarded by messages through media outlets about uh, the current situation. And I believe it has had a massive impact on the way we behave. For example, lockdown. People have responded to lockdown and uh, have been staying isolated. So we also know that media message have what we call a domino effect, which is the image that you're seeing on your screen at the moment. A message comes out through the media uh, and then we, we get people talking about that. The media then adds information to the original message and so the picture builds up. But it has a dominant effect in that it influences not only us, but the people around us and so forth. So let's take it then from the stance that the media does indeed influence us. So I'm just going to move to the next slide. If anybody's got any questions, uh, please type them now in the chat bar while I'm, I'm moving on to the next slide. OK, so media literacy is what that means is that we know that people develop attitudes and opinions about social issues that affect them and actually others by what they see in the media. So what we need to develop is something called media literacy, which is basically means that it, it's, it's, it's comprehension skills. It's about listening, viewing, 
reading and absorbing the messages that are surrounded us through different media, but actually developing the literacy skills to be able to dissect those meanings, to take from those meanings um, what we want to take from them, to analyse the messages we're being told and the knowledge we're being given, and to actually sometimes question what we're being told or to look for meaning behind it. I'm just going to move to the next slide. Again, if you've got any questions, please type them up in the chat bar. So we've talked about the media. We've ascertained that the media does indeed influence the way we think, feel and behave. We've seen a little bit of evidence from a historical social experiment, which was the Orson Welles War of the Worlds radio broadcast. And I've introduced you to something called media effects theory. And now we're moving into media literacy and how we develop those skills. Now, I'm sure you've all seen an episode of Gogglebox. So let's have a look at what Gogglebox does. Gogglebox, as, as I'm sure you know, is a weekly TV program that is aired and people seem to enjoy it. We know it has good audiences. And I think the format of the programme is such that we are being encouraged to be active in our viewing. And with that, that is being reflected in the way that the programme itself is broadcast. So what you have is you have cameras in people's homes, people that we can say are like us. We get to know those people. We can see ourselves sometimes in those people. They are normal, if I may use that word, people who very much represent who we might be or who we feel we are. We go into their homes, we get to see their lives and the programs that they're watching and we listen to their conversations about what they're watching. In fact, their analysis of what they've been asked to watch. And some of those analysis are very, very amusing. I mean, we do, we do become quite connected to those characters. They are consumers of TV and film, just like we are. And as they're watching in their different family groups, they are dissecting what they are watching. They are having conversations about it. And we can empathize with them because I think a lot of us watch television. We might discuss, if not, if we are watching isolate, isolated, so we're watching something on our own, we might then discuss what we have watched with others when we get together with them. So television, film gives us something to share, to communicate about, which is what they're doing on Gogglebox. They are dissecting TV programmes from the comfort of their own homes. And what I'm going to do now is we're going to have a little clip of this. But what I want you to think about is what they are saying. What is it that they're talking about? So there's a film. There is a piece of news. And there is a documentary that they are dissecting. They're talking about it. They're saying, well, they're saying what comes into their heads, which is a fantastic starting point from analysing any piece of information. So what I want you to do is watch this next clip. And then what I'd like you to do is as you're watching those clips, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds just to, to maybe write something down or go get a pen and paper if you haven't got one, or you can actually just type directly into the chat box and I will respond to anything you put on there. But just put whatever is coming into your head as you're watching this next clip. Daniel, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Um, so the clip that Lynn mentioned that we're just about to watch, I put a link again into... Um, into the chat window in case that works better for people. But I'm going to share it now here as well. Go to the main screen, right, ready to go. The most iconic scene of the movie saw baddie Darth Vader come face to face with goody Luke Skywalker. Oh. Is that your lightsaber or you just pleased to see me? What Skywalker? Give it to him one time. Oh, he shot his bloody hand off. Oh, oh. That's, that's got work. Well, at least it's been a laser, it'll cauterize it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one, that's the good side, side of it, Luke. This is the iconic, like, moment, isn't it? I would have loved to have been in the cinemas when you first realized this, though. Yes, that's your dad. 
Yeah, yeah, Ken. <laughs> Just reminds me of being a kid watching Star Wars. And, and my mum going, Ten character! <laughs> <laughs> And then me and my brother running the bag going, <laughs> Which one of you was Darth Vader? Paul. Yeah, he was always the baddie. I was Princess, Princess Leia. I can see that. that. Yeah. Mr. Trump was in trouble again on Monday. That's quite major, though, for like the FBI to be investigating the president. They are investigating. So the, FBI, the FBI are investigating now, so there must be something behind some this one. Yeah, some of the found some out, as they won't be investigating, would they? So Russia wanted Trump in because he wouldn't interfere with Because he was that. isolationist and that he wasn't going to be interfering across the world, throwing his way to bad. I did not have relations with those Russians. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I've never seen nothing like this happen before. And if they're coming out of it in public, they're going to have it. They're saying they don't know something. They're standing up to him, aren't they? They're standing up to Trump and saying something's gone on. Yeah, and we will find out. Yeah, and we will. So there wasn't no white happened or nothing. He just basically just he just like yeah, yeah, just made something up to just deflect something basically. You know, you have one of those dreams and you feel like it's kind of real when you wake up. Yeah, yeah it was one of those ones. It's got straight on Twitter. Yeah. On Thursday night, Channel Four introduced us to a very unusual bunch of people. Oh, the Mormons. There must be loads of men watching this and thinking, how can I get that set up? In the programme, we met Enoch. He's got 16 children and two wives. He's definitely punching with them two. Them two with the long, luscious, curly locks. He's not even good looking. He's not. He's not even hot. Don't tell me those women don't get jealous of each other. I mean, that's human nature, isn't it? God. I wonder, I wonder which, which one he likes the best. I don't know. Oh my god. Oh, where's he going? Where does he find them? There must be a shortage of men over there. There must be, yeah. Uh, so it's always men, though, that do it. You never get women saying, oh, God knows how many husbands, because one's bad enough. Right, thanks for watching. I'm just going to get the slides back up, Lynn. One second. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so let's have a look. Um, um, we've had a clip there of Gogglebox, and the first clip that they were being asked to analyse was Star Wars and the scene with Luke Skywalker. And one of the characters on the sofa there said, Oh, this is the iconic moment. It's his dad. Now, that is around relationships and expectations we have of family structures and how we feel about them. Uh, and so in a way that could be linked to sociological theory. The next comment is around one of the characters on the sofa saying, oh, that's making me reflect on my childhood memories and running around with my brother with lightsabers. So in a way that links to academic studies in how film impacts on us and memory um, and the relationships that we have with each other as we're watching films such as going to the cinema. I'm just going to go to the next slide. There we go. There you go. So you can see that as well. Hopefully everybody can see that. So the idea around how film can impact on um, our memories of childhood is something that can be studied also in sociology, i.e. under media effects. We then move on to a political discussion, uh, which is a documentary that was being broadcast about how the FBI are observing the president of the USA. And in a way, that can be linked to the politi to polit politics and democracy, but also trying to understand theories on what is a democracy and how politics and demo democracy work and the accountability that politicians have to the citizens that they are, in a way, um, ruling. Then we have a final programme 
that the audiences on the sofa were being asked to analyse, which was Three Wives and One Husband, which was a documentary about family structure, a religious group that has a different family structure than many of, of us might accept as being the normal and again I apologize for, you, for using the word the normal but again this is something that could be linked to the sociological theory so studying sociology at university so let's go to the slide so the first piece of clip that the goggle boxes were asked to analyze centered on the role of the father Darth Vader we can link that to sociology the second clip was around the FBI being involved. So this was about politics, the politics. We have our own politics, of course, in the UK connected to our own government. And as voters and citizens in a democracy, our government are accountable to us. And that will be something you might study in more depth if you were studying a degree in politi political sciences. So can you see now how our actual TV viewing, although they are analysing from their sofas in quite an informal chatter and in many parts very humorous way, you can link those day to day activities to academic thought linked to media, sociology, politics. So the Gogglebox programme has introduced us to some starting points. What is a really good thing to do from that would be to say, well, OK, it's talked about family structure. It talks about democracy and politics. It talks about family relationships. You could then use Google to move those general thoughts and discussions into getting to, into more depth um, so that TV not only becomes something that entertains us, it can inform us, introduce us to ideas beyond our own everyday existence. But then we can look further by using Google to see where we could explore these ideas. OK. Another good form of media, of course, is newspapers. And this is an article that I read in The Guardian newspaper last week. And it was an article all about how film can be not only a torch on society to illuminate certain parts of society, but also a headlight that it can reflect light onto our society. And I've got a couple of quotes that I've taken from that article. And again, if you've not read the article, you can use Google to find this article. You would just put in The Guardian, the 15th of the 5th, and maybe something like uh, film as a torch on society. So we're moving into a discussion about film now and the media literacy that we can develop through watching films. OK. A well-crafted story, a cinematic experience is unique. It gives people a profound experience, makes them question themselves and give them hope. And that's from somebody called Steve Coogan, who you may have um, seen. He used to have his own sitcom programme and comedy. He's a comedian and also an actor. And then a second person, Francis Ford Capella, and I quote, suggests in the article, Perhaps now it is the artists, particularly cinema, who need to play the role of being the headlights of society to express themes and principles and stimulate and change former long held principles. So I think what Steve and Francis are saying here is that film as part of media production can not only give us a profound experience and I think that certainly happened with going back to Star Wars the iconic moment it's his dad but it can also start us to thinking about our own experiences about our own experiences of family of relationships of ourselves. and I think what Francis Capella is touching on is how film as a form of media can also reflect what's going on in society and encourage us and invite us to explore further our sense of self and our sense of the world around us. And film is also used to stimulate debate, to stimulate change, to stimulate the production of new perspectives and encourages us to look beyond our own existence and our own meaning of life and the world around us. So I'm now going to try 
and explore that a little bit further, hopefully in relation to yourselves. So now what I'm doing is inviting you in now to get engaged. Come and get engaged in. What we do in the classroom normally is we will be saying, OK, let's get the flip chart and pens out and let's have a look at what you think so far and reflect on your favourite film or something that you've seen on a TV screen that represents you and the world you know. OK, so what I want you to do is just for a minute to think about this as we get ready to move into the activity around exploring our favourite film. So just so, just spend a few seconds just thinking about what's written on this slide. OK, I'm coming back in now. I'm going to share my favourite film with you and why it's my favourite film. Well, it's one of my favourite films, I'll be honest with you. One of my favourite films is Educating Rita. It's a UK film from 1983 and it was based on a play written by Willie Russell. Willie Russell, again, if you want to Google his name, Willie Russell, you'll find that he writes, he's written a lot of screenplays and the screenplay is about normal people, normal working class people in many instances and everyday experiences. And Olivia's just asking, has anybody seen this film? And Joe is responding by saying, yeah, it's a great film. Yes, it is a great film, Joe. It is. It's a great, great film. And it's a great film to me. And this is let's just have a look at the synopsis. Let's just have a, a, a quick breakdown of what we dissect the film a bit like the YouTubers do. That's not the YouTubers, sorry, the goggle boxes. So Rita is a 26 year old hairdresser played by Julie Walters. She's working class. She comes from a non-traditional higher education family. So nobody in her family has been to university. It's not seen as an option for many, many reasons that are explored in the film. She lives with her husband, Danny. I think Danny is a joiner or a builder, but he certainly works with his hands. Danny, or Denny, wants Rita to have a baby. They've been married for several years and it's time to move on to the next stage of a traditional marriage, which is to start a family. And he wants them to live the life determined by their social class, by the people around them, by their parents, by the parents before them, by the people who are in their community and in their social circle to be a family, a working class family. Rita doesn't want to baby. Rita wants to explore her academic abilities and learn. Now this is a humorous play. I have seen it on the stage at the Alhambra Theatre in Bradford and it was very amusing. Um, and it's also a humorous film and it is available. Um, I think you can actually get it through YouTube. Within Educating Rita is an extremely strong message. So it's, it's not just Michael Caine on the screen and Julie Walters playing out what some have said is a love story. Behind that fascade, that first message around love and relationships, there is another meaning. And it's about never giving up in life and striving for what you are aiming for for not what others deem is where you should be so this is about me to say yes everybody around me is telling me as a working class woman a married working class woman a hairdresser i should now be settling down and having a family being a stay-at-home mom and supporting my husband rita didn't take the opportunity to learn when she was in compulsory education secondary school primary school etc and i've just been told that educating media is available on bbc iplayer and the reason that she didn't take the opportunity when at school is because in her the environment she lived in and the culture that she lived in and the family that she was part of didn't value education now that let me just be become a little bit tell you about myself just a little bit the reason this is one of the films, one of one, and I say one of many, 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 many films um, that strikes a chord with me and that I have a great depth of feeling for is because 
in a way, Rita reflects who I was. When I was 26, I was introduced to an access course, an access course in Leeds. And I joined that access course because I'd left school with nothing because I came from a working class family. I was the first person in my family to go to university. I had had my first child. I came out of hospital on my 21st birthday and he was five. And I realized that I was going it alone as a parent and that I needed to develop and open doors and create some more life opportunities for my, not only myself, but also my son. And I did not do well at school because education wasn't valued in the household that I lived in. So I did not engage. I was a bit of a bad one, to be honest, at school. But I realised at 26, well, I realised before, so it took me a few years to build up to joining the access course, that I wanted to break a cycle, that I wanted to change the trajectory that I was on. So this film, when the first time I watched it, really did strike a chord for me, not only in the way I felt, but also about the ideas I had about myself and the opportunities that were available. Me, university, suddenly it became an option and that then changed my behaviour. So I'm going right back to the beginning of this presentation where we talk about how the media can influence the way we behave, the way we feel and the way we think about something. And I suddenly realised that actually university was an option. Well, it wasn't suddenly, I must admit, it took me quite a while. Um, and got a lot of support to do that through an access course, which is very much like the PHE courses today, which is why I'm running the PHE course. And I'll just share a little bit of something with you. Uh, one of the lecturers did actually used to call me Rita, which at the time I thought was quite funny and complimentary. Um, but it also suggests as well that this was a very new thing for mature working class women, men as well, to go to university. It was a new thing. And it was actually linked to the politics of the time where something called widening participation was being promoted by the current government to encourage people who wouldn't normally go to university to go. And I was one of those people. So in a way, the film that media, that little piece of media, very much informed the way I thought about myself, the world around me and my actions. So now what I want you to do is I want to know what is your film? What's your favourite film, the film's title? Just put it up there. Give us a little bit of a blurb. What's the storyline or what's the main storyline that you got from it? What are the main carriers, characters rather? and what it is you like about this film. So what we're going to do now is go on to an interactive whiteboard. So it's going to be a screen, a blank white screen, and at the top of your screen, you will see a T. Uh, you've got a T and you've also got an image of a pencil. And what you can do with those is you can now write up your comments. If you don't want to do it on the whiteboard, you can actually do it in the chat bar. So I'm just going to turn my microphone off and wait for a few minutes. So what I've done is I've just put up one of the blank slides from earlier in the presentation. And as Lynn says, um, I think it's probably better to use the T that's on the top of the screen on the left hand side. If you click on that, click anywhere on this slide, you can start typing um, and you can tell us something about your favourite film or a film that you've watched recently that you've enjoyed and why it's resonated for you. So we'll just give you a few minutes to do that. And as we say, please, if you're not comfortable with using the whiteboard, oh, somebody's found the pencil, lovely. Uh, best to use the tea if you want, if you can. And if you want to rub anything out, you can use the, the icon to the right of the tea, which is a um, rubber. Uh, so, and you can use, also use the chat for this part.
So if you can see the T at the top of the screen, it's a, on mine it's blue. I'll just see if I can point at it. And if you use, if you click on that and then click anywhere on the slide, you should be able to type. So somebody's just identified the uh, Billy Wilder film, Some Like It Hot, and how obviously the whole family enjoyed it. So it was obviously in ch including children, so it was obviously very inclusive. Tell us a bit more. Tell us about, give us a bit of a funniness from it. Anything, why, something that comes straight to your head when you think of that film. I love that somebody's actually identified with Neil and I. Absolutely iconic film. Taming the Shrew. Wow. Blindside. Yes, I remember Blindside. Bullet. Keep going. I'm going to turn me back. Okay. Oh, where's it gone? Come back. We seem to have lost all the the comments, but we had something there around with Neil and I. Again, a very very funny movie. Somebody actually put down a film that made them feel that women should be strong. Um, I'm just going to go back again to that slide. We've got in the chat bar, we've got my film is The Gods Must Be Crazy. This story is that the characters moved from a very remote African village to a big city. Keep talking, please, Elias. Please, please keep talking. Oh, Joe's saying that, that. Oh, wow. So why is it why is it your husband's favourite film, Joe? It's funny. We love us, we love a funny film. All of us love a funny film, but tell us why it's your fav your husband's favourite film as well, Joe. Seize the day, Isabel, absolutely. Humour's really good, isn't it? Humour's an excellent way to, to get a message across. Absolutely. Oh, Long Walk to Freedom, Frank. Absolutely brilliant film. Oh, absolutely brilliant, Frank. Anything in particular about Long Walk to Freedom, Frank, that, that makes it the film that's a special for you? Oh, The Pursuit of Happiness is another. You're just going to hear me going, oh, my God, yeah, another really good film. Yes, I love the films. Thank you, Willa. Pursuit of Happiness, again, so many strong, strong messages hidden within that film about fatherhood. Um, a lot. I think a lot of the films that I'm seeing you putting up are films about people um going against the odds so to speak oh gold digger oh she got mad tonight she was being judged and seen as a gold digger because yes in society there are perceptions about younger women um seeking relationships with older men and it's about um money grabbing i get that absolutely isabel i get that so i can see that the film choices that you're putting forward are films that are around people going against the odds people breaking a cycle with nail and i there are so many humorous one-liners in that film um and then we've got Carol, pretty soon. Yeah, we're going to hear from Carol as well soon. Uh, we've got Pursuit of Happiness by Will Smith. Thank you so much for sharing those ideas you've got there um, about the films. And if we were in class now, we would probably be going for a cup of coffee, coming back, sitting down and all getting very, 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 very excited about all the films that you've just talked about. So thank you ever so much for sharing those. But I hope what that's done, because you very quickly had films there, um, and I'm not sure whether you did or didn't watch them beforehand, but whether or not you did or not, this activity has done what I hoped it would do, and it's uh, demonstrated the enthusiasm we have for films as a form of media, but also that 
I think from what from what I can see in the comments box, the films that you've identified in some way have had an impact on the way you think about something, feel about something or behave. And particularly the one where um, I'm not sure who said it, but uh, somebody talked about a film and they remember watching it with the whole family. So as an activity, um, it brought back happy memories, warm memories. Thank you. So I think it might be time to hear from one of our current students now. Is that correct? Yes, uh, thanks very much, Lynn, and thanks all of you for participating in that section. It's really lovely to hear the kinds of films you've enjoyed watching, and it, I kind of wish that we could carry on for longer and do a real analysis of these. Um, but we'll tell you more about how you can do that within PHE and really explore some of the, the media and the things that you're already really interested in through your own research. But now we're going to hear from Carol, one of our student learning champions, who completed the PHE course about a little bit later than this last year, I think, Carol, and has now yeah. progressed on to the first year of a degree. So I'm going to hand over to you, please. Uh, no pressure. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, as Olivia has said, my name's Carol. Um, I am currently just finishing my first year of professional studies. Um, and before that, last year, I had completed the PHE course. Um, and for me, I suppose a little bit about it, it's an invaluable experience. Um, you learn so much that is incredibly helpful for your degree in whatever progression that you decide to do. Um, the skills that you pick up um will you know the skills that you pick up will be for assignments how you do stuff how you complete stuff referencing you know so you may not know those skills at the moment but phe gives you those skills um, and all of those skills will be invaluable for when you go on to your degree um which you actually find if you're in a degree for the campus wide you have those skills that traditional age students don't have and you they end up asking you about stuff um <clears throat> excuse me it's just a real great preparation it gets you onto campus it gets you comfortable with being on campus and the the style of education cuz it's very different to how other, others have done um so that's just a little bit about PHE um for me my history is that i had gone through the progress of functional skills um onto my GCSE english and maths um before going into the LLC and trying taster sessions, um, I was around for about 18 months before I even decided that university was the right thing for me. Uh, for me, I had to be in the right place. Uh, one of my barriers is my mental health issues and that had to be in a good enough place that I could commit to university because I suppose that's the biggest thing that you have to do is, the, is commit. Um, you know, and because of those barriers, the support that is on offer through the LLC and through the campus has been invaluable. Uh, there are so many different things. If you're dyslexic, there's a dyslexic uh, teacher person that will help you. Um, we got skills teachers that will help with other stuff. Then you've got your own personal tutors, your own lecturers. You've also got your, your classmates. Um, all of that together makes it an exciting and fun place to be. Um, you know, for me, a lot of university is about pushing my boundaries out and being out of my comfort zone. And I've been able to do that in a safe place because of the Lifelong Learning Centre. You know, without that support, I wouldn't be where I am now, you know, just sitting here talking to you. Um, a little bit about finances. Whilst I was doing PHE, which is a part time course, I was still on benefits. Um, so I was still able to claim my benefits and to claim the maintenance loan and tuition fees, uh, which was sort of really good on ease of mind about what I, what I can afford and what I can't do. Um, 
and really as soon as I sort of finished my part-time course and going on to full-time I had to come off of benefits and go on to sort of uh, maintenance loan but in that sense I was so much better off um, on maintenance loan than I was on benefits. Um, for, I think my ultimate message is do the preparation for higher education course it is the best thing that I ever did and I'm reaping the rewards now in my assignments because I did that course um, and I think I'll just leave it there. Thanks very much Carol I think you've given us a really good overview of the of your experience as a what are what's often called a non-traditional student so a student who's come to a higher education late who hasn't come straight from school um, but it's been such a positive experience for you and I think you've yeah you're really making the most of it which is lovely to hear thanks Thank ever so much um, so Lynn it's back to you to tell us a little bit about PHE now it is indeed so thank you again Carol love you to bits but you know that um, Carol as an ex PHE student who's now on a degree does remain very close to all our hearts on PHE uh, all students do uh, because it's a journey that we, we travel with you over the year uh, all the tutors do so let's have a look what I've tried to do today apart from bumbling a little bit. So I just want you to take, hold this in mind, everybody that's listening, that this is the first time I've done a lecture online. And I think there's been a bit of bumbling. Um, but one of the main taglines for PHE is that we learn more through our mistakes and reflecting on those mistakes than we do by getting anything right the first time. Failure for PHE students is actually success. Um, so please bear that in mind as well for me because it is the first time I've done this and come on to the next one because it will get better, I promise. Anyway, so what we've tried to do in this last hour is introduce you to media literacy skills, which I hope it has done. So remember the next time you're watching something on television or you're thinking about the films that you've identified yourself today, Google them, just Google them and have a look. There will be some analysis uh, through Google on media products that you consume and ones that you hold dear to yourselves. Uh, so have a read around it and you will learn so much more about why that film is your favourite film or TV programme. What you'll also learn uh, is, is to keep looking and using not just the internet, but um, articles in good quality newspapers that dissect and analyse hidden meaning within media. So that's media literacy skills. So hopefully you will take, we'll take something new away with you today linked to that. We've tried to explore how we can be more active television and film consumers. So there's no more putting your feet up and pouring a glass of wine or whatever when you're watching television from now on. Try and become more active because we do use a lot of television and film as part of the learning resources on the PHE programme. I've tried to highlight how film and TV informs our ideas and how we can stimulate further exploration of these during and after we have watched or consumed some form of media. The session has also reflected how learning is designed on the course. It's about your perspectives and what you bring to the course, your experiences, and how we can use those to explore further the knowledge that you already have and expand on that, become more informed. The PHOE course does use newspapers, TV and film as learning resources. And what we do is we explore those in an informal, friendly manner and talk about why things mean something to us. But what we then do is try and link that to academic thought and theory so that so that academic theory becomes something that you shouldn't be afraid or think that you can't handle because it says theory and academic on it. We can, we can all access academic thought and theory and reflect. So do we do what it says on the tin, i.e. prepare you for higher education? What we try to do is look first of all at what other qualifications you might need when coming on the course that alongside the PHE certificate you may need to progress on to your chosen degree in whatever field that may be. We prepare services for priming, i.e. we look at what you already hold as mature students, the experiences, your thoughts, your perceptions, your ideas about the world around you 
and we use those to create what I call a gripper coat a gripper coat once you've got a gripper coat you've got something that we can then throw onto it new knowledge theories new ideas new perspectives and analyze what we think we know or not it's a testing pot the PHE course is definitely a testing pot it gives you the opportunity to test what university life and university study is what it can be like whether it's for you what you already have that will support you on your journey and what we need to build on and we build up in colors so what we do is we start with your experiences and throughout the year we build layers onto that so by the end of the year you are a I'm going to use the word competence, but competency means many different things to many people, but that you feel more confident to be able to tackle degree level study. And what the PHE course does is allow you time to get settled into the idea of being a student, being a scholar with nail and eye scholars. It's about you becoming confident in that new identity, i.e. I'm a university student. I'm an academic thinker. The course content builds a foundation of knowledge, particularly in terms of which degree you're going on to. Uh, so when we bring somebody onto the course, when they have made an informed decision that the course is going to do what they want it to do on the team, get them ready for their degree, we then highlight which modules of study, these are learning modules you will need to follow on the PHE course that will best prepare you, prepare your services for your degree. So for example, if you wanted to do something like politics, sociology, uh, geography even, you would do something called the People in Society, which is a sociology module. If your degree of choice is going to be something around working in healthcare, nursing, midwifery, radiography, etc., we put you onto a module of learning called Human Biology, which give you some of the basics of biology that you will need to thrive on your degree. There are other modules of study as well, such as childhood development and education for those that may be thinking about going into learning and teaching or family support roles. This, once we've done that, once we start to build that knowledge base up for you so that when you go on to your degree, you're not floundering. You, you, you think, yes, I have heard of this theory before. Yes, I have heard of that research before. What we do is build up is what's called academic integrity, which means that you know how to navigate yourself around the university system, that you know how to become an academic reader, an academic writer, a researcher. Uh, but you also have the confidence to go into the unknown, i.e. Google's a great place to start, but where to go from there so that the information that you are seeking out analyzing writing about and then actually then conducting some of your own independent research on um, is academic in a sense it's knowledge that's being presented in an academic format it gives you a taste of testing at university level the phe program because it's preparing you for university level we have to also explain Bores you to those nasty things like exams and essays and research reports. We also introduce you to things like discussion forums and blogs, which are used an awful lot now at university level. We do a lot around reflective writing. You have experience, you have that knowledge, you come with that. That is already there. And what we do is you, we support you to reflect on those experiences and take them further so that you're not only exploring your own perspective, but that of others, what not only informs our perspectives and other people's perspectives, but how we can develop a more analytical approach to what we think we know. And then we also use multiple choice questioning, which is a form of exam. So the PHE builds skills and knowledge in layers. Bit by bit throughout the year, we support you to get yourself up the scaffolding. It's called a scaffolding theory of learning. So if you want to Google that, that is a theory. It's called a pedagogy, which basically means the theory of how people learn. And we follow those theories. So I'm handing over to you to see if you've got any questions now for us before we hand back to Olivia. So if you'd like to put anything in the chat bar, please feel free to do so now. 
Thanks very much, Lynn. And everyone, I'm aware that we have run over, but it would be really nice if we could carry on a little bit longer, maybe for another five minutes or so. So we've got time for questions. Discussion. And discussion. If everyone's happy with that, um, please just stay <laughs> uh, and then we can tell you at the end once we've had a bit of a chat what we're going to send you afterwards but please do use the chat bar to ask questions or if you want to raise your hand we can unmute you you can ask a question that way but the chat bar might be the quickest and easiest whichever you prefer i do apologize for the no but it's not unusual for me <laughs> and i'm sorry about this person who's drilling outside my window right now or cutting their head What we'll do is we'll uh, keep an eye on questions as they're coming in and try and address them. But while we're waiting for you to ask any, um, I'll just take you through a little bit of information about what we're going to send you after the session. Um, we'll be sending you, as I said at the beginning, an email with a recording of today's session so we can review that. You can review that in your own time. Um, and the Lynn's email, which is also obviously on this slide, if you want to get in touch and ask any individual questions about the programme or the content of today's session. Uh, we'll also be sending information about our advice and guidance service. Um, so this is a service for uh, any adult who has a degree. Um, you're able to book an appointment with, with one of our guidance workers. Um, let me just take you to a slide about that. Our guidance workers are Denise and Mohammed, and you can just email or ring us to make an appointment. We'll put all the details in the um, follow-up email. And this is a chance to just talk on the phone with someone one-to-one, -one, completely confidential, completely impartial. They're not trying to sell you PhD or any particular university or about your what you want to do and try and to how it might fit around your life commitments and what you've got going on in your life and they they can guide and advise you they can also advise you about some of the finance issues affecting adults I know we've got a question about that now um, around uh, when you can apply for student loans. I think the, um, the yeah, Jenny's already answered part-time finance applications open in June. Just to quickly go over some of the key issues of student finance, you don't pay fees up front, although there's a lot in the media about debt um, and high fees for university. The way that it's structured is it doesn't actually make mean that you're out of pocket by starting a course. You get a tuition fee loan from the government, which most people are eligible for, but if you did a guidance appointment, we could talk about your eligibility. Basically, as long as you haven't already been to university in the UK and you have um, the right residency status and you've been in the UK long enough, you should get a loan which will pay your fees from that comes from the government, go straight to the university, you don't need to worry about it and you don't need to repay anything on that until you're earning above, I think it's gone up now to almost £27,000. If you never earn that much, you don't repay it. So there's also financial support to help with the cost of living. If you don't pay back your fees, your debt is wiped, it's not passed on to anyone in your house, it's not secured against your home, anything like that. Um, so there's financial support to help you with the cost of study basically. Has anyone got any more questions for Lynn or for us generally? No. Okay, well, I really hope you will be able to book, uh, get in touch with us and book a guidance appointment if you haven't already had one, because that will really help you make your decision about whether you do want to do a course at university. The email we send you will also include a link to our landing page, and that will have details of lots of different event sessions that are coming up over the next couple of months. But just to draw your attention to one that's happening tomorrow, we're actually having at two o'clock tomorrow an Ask Us Anything session with Denise and Mohammed, our guidance workers, where you literally can ask them anything. And all those fears and worries about studying at, at higher in university as an adult, you can um, deal with can be dealt with within that session and you can really get some good question, um, answers to any all your worries there it will also the female include a link to our return to study Facebook 
age and that's a nice thing to join you can ask people like Carol questions about their experience and they'll answer you there um, lots of mature students are on that and lots of adults who are thinking about maybe going to university um, and lastly it'd be really useful to know what you thought of the session we're still finding our feet with doing these online sessions I think one of my colleagues is putting together here we are a lovely poll now um, and it's very simple to use you just click on the bar that applies to what you think did you find it useful not useful or anything in between and finally unless anyone's got any final questions for us I really like thank you for joining us today because I know we're not none of us are in a particularly easy situation at the moment and we're very grateful that we uh, we're not talking to ourselves basically and that we've got you here um, interested in uh, the session that we're putting on and you you're full of questions and it's just lovely to interact with you so um, if you have an any final questions please do post them in the chat thanks Joe thanks Frank it's really lovely to hear your feedback and then how you leave the session when you're ready to you're very welcome Isabel you just click on the three lines on the top left hand corner and that will open a menu I must remember not to click on it myself now and at the bottom of that menu there's a leave session button so you just click on that it's got a red arrow thanks everybody I'm seeing some really lovely responses in um, the chat there so it's really nice to hear that you've enjoyed the session and we really appreciate your feedback we will send you an evaluation form in the email as well which is very short but it just gives us a little bit more information on uh, what we could do to improve our sessions in the future.